I want to make sure that I have the mute because I have a monitor. All right, we are live. And we are waiting for Lena to be here. She'll be here momentarily. Got held up. It was kind of stormy out here. And with me now, I have Susan Ibitz. And Susan has been watching the behavior panel on my channel. So she knows, well, she picked the wrong shirt. I'm not sure why she chose the red shirt, because the red shirt is who shot. But I'm trying to her. mute. Yeah, um, let me mute my life. Why I picked the wrong shirt? When I do a uh, Comic Con, and I do a lot, because believe it or not, um, uh, Spock was created, his face was created based in physiognomy. So I talk about that, about Yoda, Darth Vader. So um, beside the t shirt, we have Darth Vader face ex micro expression. So we are on the top. Hey, Lena. <laughs> Hi, guys. All right. We have Lena Cisco here. So let's do a quick introduction. Um, I'll just start with Susan. Tell us who you are and what you're about. My name is Susan Ivitz. I'm a human behavior hacker. Some people have computers. I have humans. I'm a specialized in body language, micro expression, statement analysis, forensic analysis, personality types, face reading, and now a new specialty, face reading with mask. All right. And Lena. Hi, I am a former Navy intelligence officer and a former Marine Corps certified interrogator. And I interrogated down in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba shortly after 9-11. Uh, since that time, I have been working for, working with and training numerous government agencies. And I am a keynote speaker. I travel around the world providing training and speaking to people. I did a three-year series as an expert witness on Couples Court with the Cutlers. I gave a TED Talk back in 2015, and I'm also a speaker for the International Spy Museum, and I'm featured in two of their exhibits. Oh, awesome. oh by the way, I'm a former student of Lena. He is. She I is. I need to That's confess, cool. I took the yeah, first yeah. civilian class she did, and I need to say something about Lena. I stalked in her for two years after I saw her TED talk and read her book and like, please, I want to be trained by you. And like, no, no. When she finally did a civilian class, my dad get really, really sick and I need to travel to another continent to take care of him. And I says, Lena, I sorry, I cannot do it the first class. And he says, girl, family come first, don't worry. And she gave me the first class only for me really late on the oh. time. So. Lena become really, really somebody really important in my life, not because she's an amazing professional, she showed to be the same level of human being. So it's fair to say it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Also, I believe to tie together with many other um, experts on the panel, I believe Lena, you know Greg Hartley because yes, he introduced us. Yes, yeah, he's a good friend of mine, longtime friend of mine and, and colleague. He's amazing. I have learned so much uh, from him throughout the decade. So I feel uh, very honored to have him in my circle of friends. Awesome. <laughs> I've already got comments coming in that somebody's trying to read our body language. How funny. <laughs> I'm going to start off early, though, with a question that came in over email. And I always get excited when people are you know, looking forward to seeing this. Somebody, um, Liz, is not able to actually use her phone. She's driving and listening. Oh. So I encourage her to keep listening and not try to type. And I copied this in for you. This is specifically mostly for Susan. Okay. Well, I have and <laughs> she really wants you to analyze Epstein's face. Oh, you know what? I haven't done it. Um oh. Uh, Good news. Oh, gosh. <laughs> one, go. uh, one of the things that I says that uh, anybody who does profiler, they need to be, is not biased. And Wouldn't one of the hard. things that I try not to see people before I, I, I analyze it, and I really physically discuss with this guy, so I'm going to do my best. Uh, yeah. I'm going to see it on the big monitor. Um, he wasn't a stupid guy. Uh, he was intelligent, but intelligent not always coming with uh, moral grounds. Mm. Uh, and he was intelligent enough to make all the scams that he did for a long time without, without to be caught. Um, he was a thinker. He was a doer after. Um, he got the kind of chin that when he gave criticism, he was really, uh, I don't know if an on pot, but he was really nasty when he needed to talk to people. Uh, he had a small 
upper lip on the personal on the business side but he have a bigger deeper or thicker lip on the business uh, on the lower part business and personal meaning that he was a really good scammer uh, and mm -hmm. the kind of uh, smile that he have he have a kind of scro crooked smile you have three reasons for that when you have a fascia when you have a cardiovascular problem that you only smile from one and if you're not cutting you in contempt then i don't read micro expression for pictures because it's really sure. you need to put a context it's where you are really good selling things and you're really good at scammer and his crooked uh, uh his crooked uh, smile believe it or not it's on the personal side meaning that he keep a lot of secrets. Talking about secret, <laughs> uh, the lines on the top where the lips finish, that you have like lines, those, mm -hmm. those secret lines are like, that you're gonna bury me before I give you my black book. And that's where kind of he did. Um, he was burning the candles in two ends. Um, he did, he was laser focused, was about him. He never asked if he need to be first. He just went first when he, think or decide that he need to get done. Uh, he processed information really fast. Uh, he was a visual person and he didn't have any of the two lines on top of the lip determine uh, your sexuality. One of the things that you can do in face reading is determine when somebody's gonna be a good lover or not. Believe it or not, I have done that from friends. And one of the things who determine that a person is kind of naughty is when they don't have these two lines defined and he did definitely doesn't have any line so that's how as much as i can tell you about him and again at i'm biased in this there was uh, one question she had though specifically and that's the uh, line on his forehead above his nose that deep yeah there. uh that line we call in the train line when somebody is extremely focused and uh, co conquer something and live their life in that box to make sure that happen, those lines appear. Uh, it's funny because that line is on his business side. He doesn't have any on his personal life. He mm. didn't care too much about his personal life. He cared about the exter exterior uh, appearance uh, he cared about how he's perceived and he was uh, really focused on what he wanted to do. He liked facts and data, everything that he started, he finished and his proxemic and his way to process information was really fast. I try not to get too much information about him because again, I have a personal bias as a woman he's and a one, <laughs> uh, yeah. So, but one of the things that is he have uh, the, the, the line, there is a line on the top, uh, on the bottom of the, the nose. Mm -hmm. That line used to usually is happen with people who fall in love with everyone. So kind of playful. Mm -hmm. I will never want to marry a, a, a guy with that line. That just mm -hmm. say that. <laughs> okay, well, perfect. And I thank you that. very much. <laughs> uh, I have, I know, I'm like, do I have that? I don't know. <laughs> uh, I have one, but it's different. He have a pointy nose. I have a round nose and I have the cliff too. So I'm really playful, but in a good way, but I'm single, so <laughs> no problem. Oh, there you go. I have a cancer scar, so I'm innocent. Ah, okay. <laughs> it's not the face you want to show me, it's the face I see. So any mm. modification in your face had a meaning to. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, even even a scars, even where you do your piercings. I did a personal. I do a lot of social studies, and I did one. And why people do piercing in certain part of the face is usually because mm. they want to get attention to that part, or they're in the process to develop the feature related to some emotions and things who happen in their life. It's really interesting where the the the, the, the piercing are located. Actually, that's a great question for both of you. I've read before that, and I've noticed this anecdotally, that people who are incredibly um, tattooed up heavily, a lot of piercings, things like that, tend to be almost extremely shy. And it's like they're painting themselves to um, put forward a personality. Have you noticed that at all? 
So I know I can speak when I was in high school and some people who remember me back in the day can attest to this, but I dressed in black every day. Uh, I dyed my hair black and it was spiked probably this high off my head. And yeah. if you would, I know, I know, right? And here I am today. Um, if you would ask anybody I went to high school with, they would describe me as being shy. But I was very expressive. And I think once I gained confidence in who I was later in life, then I really came into being myself. So it's probably, it could be just a way of expressing what's inside, but it doesn't come out verbally or in our body language because we're still like, ooh, I'm being judged right now. So let me just tone it down. But I can express who I really am in other ways. Susan, what do you think? Uh same. I shaved my head since oh. I'm nine years. My mom, my mom ah, decided okay. to do that when I was four years old because he was really tired. Then I, I was in fights with boys. I was really a tomboy. Really, I, it's a miracle that I turned the way I am. And when I turned 13, 14, I was only wearing a black leather pants, those tie light leather pants. Yep. Uh, I have my hair really, really short, dye blue. Oh. Always wearing black, and I have a black widow spider this size on my shoulder, like 3D. I have skull uh, uh, tattoos. I have tattoos in my legs. I have piercing in all my body, and I have piercing in all my earrings, and I like skulls. And I was kind of bully when I was – that's the reason why I took that I think it was a protecting way because I was bully, because I was skinny and tall by the age of 10. I already was 5'7". And mm -hmm. I was reading things the other people didn't read, and I was the kid of a diplomatic family, so I w I never fed in any place. I never <laughs> feel like feeding. So when people start getting on me for being different, and I have this like weird like I, I can see people, uh, they're attacking me. So I think in my case, for example, it was more like step back because I look I look uh, harsh. I look bad. I'm gonna punch you, but it was a way to hide and I was really, really shy. This persona come up when I was 21 years old. Until then, I was a geek, no friends, hiding in my house, reading, and was my best weekends when I read by myself. So like you, Lena, I was yeah. shy and I was showing another thing. So I, I think it's possible. Yeah, I had a best friend um, and we did everything together, but I wasn't the popular person because I was always afraid of getting judged. But I was like, you know what? You can judge me because I'm still going to wear my crosses and snakes. I didn't do skulls, but I did crosses and snakes. Um, and, and yeah, and I loved it. And I'm, glad I'm Jewish. I'm not supposed to wear, be using crosses, but I use the <laughs> spiders too. <laughs> All right. Somebody uh, wrote in on that, on this note is Morsi is sung. I wore I wear black on the outside because black is how I feel on the inside. So mm. now Ooh. to a question on the evening. And I kind of want to start off here because you guys are both multidiscipline yeah. um, with, you know, Lena, you're an interrogator and you do body language and more, mm -hmm. I'm sure. And then Susan just does everything. Yeah. So I'm going to throw out an assumption and you guys just correct me if I'm wrong. Um, is your favorite art in the case of Lena, I've gotten a feeling of statement analysis. And in the case of Susan, you're a noted face reader. Would you both say that those are kind of your yeah. core um, proficiencies and everything else comes out from there? If not, let me know. I would say the teacher first. The te so um, I would say I would agree, but I would add on interrogation. So I think my forte really comes in, I am a word nerd. So it's all about the interview or interrogation. It doesn't matter what one you use because they're exactly the same. Although I know people will say, no, interrogation's harsh. It's not, it's just very strategic in nature and very planned out. Um, but so I would say any type of interviewing and statement analysis because words are critical, whether they're coming out of my mouth as an interviewer or they're coming out of yours and I'm trying to dissect it to see whether or not you tell me the truth. Do you spoil movies too? Do I what? Spoil movies. Oh, well, there's sometimes I'm like, okay, what are they coaching these actors to do? This is it's incongruent. It doesn't make sense. They should have done this. They should have done that. But, you know, I just have to sit back and say, just enjoy the movie. <laughs> I never want to happen. Lena, let's be let's be honest. We don't have a normal life. We don't have normal yeah. friends. We don't pair with normal people. Why? Because normal is boring, and we haven't been born to do the same things that everybody does. So, um, in my case, at least, let's be honest. 
Mine are face reading. I've been obsessed with face reading with mask as a way to help people not to be afraid. Fear, mm -hmm. I keep saying fear is fight, flight or froze. And a froze mm -hmm. society is a society who's not gonna come back. So there are three ways that we can move forward is mask, hygiene and distance. I can help you with one of them is reading faces with mask mm -hmm. to avoid to be afraid of others because the best expression of your face doesn't happen in the top of your nose and your mouth, happen in your eyes. Even contempt, you can see it on the lower bottom part of your eyes. And second one, like Lina, I'm fascinated by words. I, I, learn, I, I speak four languages and I was fascinated with words and I study with Lina beside Amino and Sapir and other experts because I think English not being my first language allow me to understand the difference between house and home. That car and my mm -hmm. car. And even though after I studied with Aminoan, I studied with Lina because I wanted the interrogator aspect that I never could have in person for not being part of any agency. But one of the main reasons I need to move to the forest is because the last time I went to a Starbucks in the city, I was like, you drop in on a conversation, that is a scam, don't do it. I'm like, what the heck is wrong with me? I cannot disconnect. So I live a similar life that Lina have like big big backyard uh, secluded having your own animals because this Guys, is like what, sickness. what is she you describing she's she's in the forest described her skulls and tattoos <laughs> is separated from everyone has darkness all around hmm <laughs> you know what my first realtor quit because she took me to see a five acres land that my friend says no don't buy such a i'm, I'm regretted and when she got me to the land, the realtor says, why do you want to buy such a big land? Like, because when I kill people, nobody going to be find the bodies. Exactly. And I was laughing and she didn't take it. Like, and like, you know what I do for a living? Like, mm -hmm, I'm going to call you back. She never called me back. Get out. And I ended up having another realtor. She's awesome. And I love Bonnie. I'm so happy. But like, dude, a little sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you never know. Let me jump to some questions. I have Gavin Stone, and Gavin actually is an author, and he does a bit of body reading and things himself. He is an independent contractor doing military and spy stuff and all those other weird things. Hi, Eric. Hi, Susan. I've what, uh, okay, he looks forward to working with Susan soon on masked face reading. He is part of the second phase of the study when I'm going to be teaching people how to read faces with masks. And Gavin says, I want it. I want it. So, okay, you're on. And Gavin actually appeared on the live stream with Susan. She read his face. So everybody who wants to see who Gavin is, he is there. And Lena, what would you say was your biggest challenge during your entire career? Oh, gosh. Um... My biggest challenge. You know, I do a lot of talks with the Spy Museum and I sat on a panel called Mother Daughter Sister Spy. And it was all about females being in the intel community. And I never felt challenged. I, at the time I came in, I was always accepted. And the men, because not a lot of females were in this community, especially as an interrogator, the men really supported me. I think when I felt challenged, was when I got down to Gitmo, how I was gonna be perceived by all of the detainees there. And it, what I thought was gonna happen, complete opposite. And some people, they're always wondering, well, you are a female, you must have gotten disrespected. But I was able to build such great rapport because I was what they call third gender. So I wasn't a female in their um, ethnic background or in their country. It was an American female wearing this uniform, oh, okay. doing something men, you know, men did. Um, so I, they were more curious. And because of that, their guards dropped. So it mm. ended up being such, um, I had huge successes because of that, because of that ability. I'm not threatening. I'm not scary. And so when I, they would come into interrogation, I would flat out be like, yeah, hi, I'm your interrogator. What can I do for you right now? Like, what is your main concern? And then get into the interrogation. So I guess um, the challenge was interrogation training. If I would have to say that my biggest challenge was the training I went through because I was trained by Marines and I was Navy and I was not used to their regiment. <laughs> so um, they, uh, they whipped me into shape. I'll say that. Okay. And I've got another one right away for Lena. 
Um, why do people shake their head no while their mouth is saying yes? <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna tell you a couple things. There's one thing as lie detectors, you always wanna look for behavioral congruence, right? So if I tell you, hey, that dress looks awesome on you, right? <laughs> it's not congruent, but here's the other thing. And this is something that I found out along the decades of just all my interviews is that when people say, um, no, I didn't take the drugs, I didn't do it. There's two things going on. And Susan mentioned this, you can't be biased. So sometimes people will do that quick, head nod to justify that they're saying no. It's an affirmation of no. Now, if they continue to say, no, I never did, blah, blah, blah. Now I have a problem because now that's not congruent. But you can't be tricked because some people will do a quick no and a slight head nod for that affirmation of the no. It's but almost like a head butt. Yeah, More exactly. Right. It's like I'm affirming no, but if I continue to do this, <laughs> then, then we have a problem. Yeah, she's Susan. Uh, one of the things that I love about my job is uh, the multicultural aspect. I not mm. only travel a lot, and I was born in South America, educated in Europe, and living in the United States. That is what, as a kid, was horrible. As an adult, is fascinated because I found out, for example, that, that there you need to do a baseline. It has to do with the cultures. The first time that I worked with in, in, in Asia and India, it was driving me crazy. Like. I'm so happy, like, uh, so it, it, it taught me as a pr adult and a profiler that you need to get the baseline cultural wise too. Like Lena says, if it's a deviation, you need to establish a conversation with someone. So when again, when people says uh, body language or micro expression by a picture or they call me to do, I don't do it. You need a context, you need uh, the scene what is happening. And I found out that in some Asian cultures, they have, different wave and bubble the head so but in the western cultures you find that definitely as in a spot maybe it's not the sitting is like they're doubting about their own answers because they don't want to the otello effect i don't i am afraid to talk because you're going to think i'm lying even if i'm telling the truth and if i tell him the truth you're going to think that i'm lying and when you're in certain positions in your life, like an interview, dating, and a job search, whatever, you are you're so lying. afraid that how people <laughs> is going to perceive you, there may be a doubt, even though you're not wrong. What do you think, Lena? That the pressure on the context has, the, the stakes has a lot to do with how you react. Yes. And I mean, everything you're saying about context is so critical. So when I teach body language and detecting deception and interviewing, I keep telling people, I'm like, listen, somebody may lie and cover their mouth but somebody may lie and keep all their body language open. You have to get the baseline for what that person does. Not normally, because normal is too subjective. It's what they do when they're relaxed, relaxed and happy. How they sound, how they speak, the words that they use, how they move their hands, how they move their eyes. Are they expressive? Are they not? How do they prefer to sit or stand? And as soon as you get a read, and it only takes a few minutes, now you see when you get into talking about the pertinent subjects of the conversation, does any of that change? And if it does, there's probably a reason why. And that could be relating to deception. Well, you, you have, you've talked about powerful liars too. Yes. And um, lately I was just listening for whatever reason, I get caught down bunny trails, but Casey Anthony has to be yeah. a, a perfect frameable example of a powerful liar because I don't think she says the truth for a single sentence. I she use like a running fantasy. I use a couple of her quotes from the time that she was on trial in my training for statement analysis. And when I break apart, you would be surprised at what is left looking right in front of you, which is sometimes the truth. And I always tell people the truth, you can hear it and see it right in front of your eyes. You mm -hmm. just have to pay attention to it. That's it. It's always embedded somewhere. And whether I am lining out words doing statement analysis, or if I'm in an interview and I'm carefully listening, the truth is always embedded in people's words. I've noticed that too. Now you've talked about um, halo and horns and I'll definitely want Susan in on this too. Yeah. Would you both agree that that effect, like somebody reviles me or I am not reviled, is it sometimes more valuable if possible to read a statement from them without even seeing their face, like taking body language completely out of the mix yeah. and just 
just flat out, let me see what their words are. Let me read what they said before you walk in the room. Definitely. I know right before I used to interview my litigants on the couple's court show I did, I never saw them and I would have four questions and I would have the producer send them to the litigant and they hand wrote the answers to each. And before I set eyes on this person, I would go through to see what their answers were and get a kind of a baseline from there. And I would use it just to help prepare for my interview. But it's a great way to be unbiased. Um, yeah, I. What, that is a reason, and Lena and I, we agree with that the 93% of the communication is body language is one study, was a control group, never was replicated. Sorry for the ones who still hang in on the 93%. Please, I do not. Why? Because it's not happened. Besides Zoom, how the heck are you going to see people by words? So what you said, you need to use the body with the words to know what is the incongruency. But if you send me an email or a text, I can determine if you're depressed. I train hostage negotiators and I collect, mm -hmm. I know it sounds weird, but it's worldwide. I collect suicide notes. And there are certain words like Lena, goodbye. If somebody says goodbye in a suicide note, it's somebody who's really determined to commit suicide. If a person doesn't say goodbye, they're not using certain words. I know you still can convince that person behavioral wise not to do it without lying. So the person don't do it again. I did, I started doing um, um, anonymous letters. And the last two cases that I have, they're under, under the media. I cannot say where cases are, are, but one is I found out like why the wife is attacking the husband. Like it's not the way, like the letter was written by the wife for this and this mm. and this. It's the, the level of intimacy. And the other one was like, I did a description of the person was doing a complaint in a company. Why is this? Everybody signed their own word, their own letters, even they're anonymous. Everybody give away. I never pay attention to the first uh, minutes of the conversation. I start paying attention only to baseline. After that, when you're relaxing, you forget. And something that I learned from all the amazing people that I have to learn from is people don't like to you. We don't do the right questions. So pay attention on the change of verbs, mm -hmm. sentence, the way. Suddenly, if I'm describing what I did today, and I remember like one of the things that I learned by Lena because she nailed it in my head, do never do a composed question. Never ask two questions in one because they're gonna oh. choose what to do. Mm. But if you get exercise, you use it to know what the people wanna avoid to. That is a good one. But yeah, sometimes I prefer to read an email or a statement than see the person because you don't have any bias. What you see is what you get. Sometimes I ask to be erased the name when I work with lawyers. I do a lot of, a lot of um, statement with lawyers and I ask them to erase the names, erase the places. And I go through the statement and like, he went from like, yeah, I was driving my car and the uh, we have a crash and the police arrived. Like, wait a minute. You even tell me what you have for breakfast and what happened later, but why is only 10% of your statement the accident? Something is doesn't make sense. After another camera look, he was the one crossing a red light. So those are the things that you need to pay attention and you need to read really careful who you study with. Mm -hmm. That's the reason I is talking people like Lina and Amino and, and another teacher is because words are important, but in order to learn it right, you need to go to the right person too. Because, oh, you're lying and pointing fingers because you watch Lie to Me or one of those shows on TV <laughs> is one of the biggest. Uh, there are studies showing that Paolo did a study in 2011. The people who, are, who watch the show Lie to Me in numbers were less accurate finding lies than the people who never saw a show. Why? Because they were looking for lies. And it's something that you always say in your interviews, Lena. If you're going looking for lies, that's the only thing you're gonna find. If you're going open mind to, let's see what I see in your words and in your body, that's when you're really gonna find out what, you, what you're looking for or what the person is telling you or the statement is telling you. Mm -hmm. Perfect, that leads into the next thing, which I'm sure you guys have had a great time with. Oh, by the way, Ga Gavin, thank you very much for advising me how to bury bodies. And <laughs> I mean, really, that is public chat. He's advising me. I to have put my glasses on to yeah. see. No, no, don't, no now don't, I can don't. see. 
<laughs> I guess you'll get ADD on it. <laughs> <laughs> of course, Gavin would tell you. Good Lord. Yeah, dark sense of humor. I love it. Hey, hey, you see how I'm wearing? It's close over the place. Hello. <laughs> well, before you bury the body, it may be caused by this next question. And it's, Ooh. does being so proficient in reading body language create challenges in your personal relationships? Like you lied, now you die. <laughs> <laughs> you lie, now you die. Oh, I get asked that all the time. And I tell people, you just have to shut, you can't shut it off, but you have to pick and choose your battles. So if somebody in my close circle is lying to me and it's to make me feel good, okay. Or to avoid an argument because I love a debate, okay, I'll let it go. But um, but if it's with malicious intent, I'm going to call you out. We're going to have a problem. Susan. Uh, it's a reason I'm single. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I was talking with Lena this week. Like, girl, how you how you manage to have a man that can put out with you? Like, because he's in the same field, stop the yeah. day as civilians. And it's true. Um, I do the same. I do make wild lights because some people is not ready. And I lost a really good friend of mine because I didn't understand it wasn't about the truth. So what she wasn't ready to hear it. Uh, mm. That conduct to she live in a violent situation, but she never called to me again. And that's what I learned the mm. worst lesson. You need to wait for the other person to be ready. Sometime a white light, that's when we have a society. We cannot have a society without white lights. It's like your husband, you as your husband, how I look in this dress, perfect. Yeah. And you shut up. Why? Yeah. Because you don't want to sleep with the dog. So again, like Lena, if I'm negotiating a contract <laughs> or I'm in a dating situation or it's a high stakes, mm -hmm. I do not tell maybe that I caught you in a lie, but I'm going to keep digging to know why, because my geeky brain needs to keep why. But when I'm working, I never disconnect it. In my personal life, I still run into is what I do and wait for the person is like, my first question is like, are you venting? Are you consulting? Are you talking to Susan, your friend? Are you talking to Susan Ivitz, the profiler? Explain me so I can put my brain on the right box and not get my mouth, my food in my mouth. Because that one of the problems that you have like, don't you see it? People don't want, sometimes they want it to be lied. Yeah. So I have an employee. I'm going to give an example. I was hiring a new tr uh, person for the new study. She was perfect. I read her face and says, she's too emotional. And I did the interview and says, do you know what we do for a living? Oh, let me check. She sent me an email two days later and says, I don't know if I want to know what my husband is doing. Wow. She didn't say no to the job. When she found out that one of the trainings is going to be to know what we know in order to do the study, she says, I don't want to know what my husband is doing. Which so, she knows. It means she knows she played down because she had four kids. Mm -hmm. I'm not I'm not criticizing what I'm saying is mm, oh, sure. that is really common. Some people is not ready and prefer prefer to play dump, and that's one of the things then I'm learning to play dump when I can. It's funny, uh of all the sources, I think there's a saying by Adam Carolla that I think fits really well. Does it make me happy or make me money? If not, who cares? Don't pursue it. <laughs> Yeah. So it's an interesting, different kind of angle. And I also think of Mark Bowden. I'm sure you're both familiar with him. Yes. He's yes. on the other side of it in a lot of ways. Yeah, he does reading, but he's all about projecting and putting out. Yep. And I almost wonder if people who are studying body language also should maybe take a, a little bit of influence and persuasion classes. So yep. that way they can determine, okay, so they're lying to me. So what, who care? And, and be able to turn off the, the reader that can kind of make people feel uncomfortable in the room. Would that be a fair thought? And it's, it's point to like, you want to be right or you want to have friends. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you want to be right all the time, you're not going to have friends. You're not going to ever have relationships. Why? Because as simple like you're in a relationship, your partner come home and says, how was your day? Great. Uh, well, tell that to your face. So you shut up and says, okay, honey, do uh, you want a glass of wine? You want to take a bath? Uh, you want to go downstairs and play some PlayStation? And mm -hmm. when you want to talk with this dog, and like, yeah, thank you very much. You don't need to go like, oh, I know that you have a horrible day because you get this guy's <laughs> like, no, it's to simplify communication the same way when you go on a date or you're talking with a friend and like, no, because this and that, I'm like, it's not that way. 
So you want to be right or you want to have friends or you want to have a relationship. It's yeah. difficult enough to have a normal life doing what we do. Sure. Um, I get on the cover of newspaper and where I live in and now I'm messed it up because I was anonymous, now no anymore. Now my neighbors know who I am and what I do. But the point is, it's difficult because people, first of all, is like, oh, you're judging me. And any argument you have, like, oh, you using your tricks, like, no, I'm just a girl with stuff because you was late on the cinema and we lost the <laughs> ticket. Don't use my profession. Lena? Yeah, oh, yeah. So um, I get told all the time, don't interrogate me. And the problem is, is sometimes I need to hear that, though, because Mm. Susan and I, our brains have, they work a little differently now. And especially for me, I've been interrogating for two decades now. And my job is to drill down and get the truth. But sometimes when I bring that to my personal relationships, I'm like, I got this. And being a word nerd, I dissect every word. And so I'll ask a follow-up question and then I'll do this and that. And all of a sudden, the people around me are like, stop already. <laughs> and then I'm thinking, do I really need to know? Probably not. I probably can ease up a little bit. And so it's hard, though, because once I detect any type of deception or any, you know, whatever kind of lie it is, embellishment or something to make me feel good or just omitted, I want to go after it. And I want to just get it down to the nuts and bolts and be like, oh, OK, that's what it is. Now I can move on. But a lot of people don't like to get down to that level that I do. I have a question for Lena. I'm sorry. I'm going to take your place, um, Eric. <laughs> Lena, doesn't happen to you that this is not your job, is not your hobby, is your life? Like you reading an advertisement like, oh, this is manipulation. They're a false advertisement. <laughs> I'm not going to buy this because actually it doesn't say that it's 100%. It's like that it's people say is it's 100%, but it's not 100%. It's get to a point that this is not like to be a doctor that you stop when you leave the hospital or being a lawyer that you stop yeah. when you leave the office. Yeah. This is in order to be good in this, in order to make a career, in order to have a respect name, you breathe and smell this. Yeah. And I'm never going to excuse or justify or say sorry for it. Mm -mm. It's my life. I spent the last 30 years of my life going against every odds who told me I cannot do it. Mm -hmm. So in my case, I know I don't say neither permission or sorry for what I do. Mm -hmm. So Lena, it's happened to you. you even yeah. when you stay lean, yep. you see another boat passing like, hmm, that's a weird situation. It's not happened the same to you? All the time. And so I used to tell people back in the day when I was first starting out, I called it the light switch. And when I had to go into an interview, I would flick on the light switch and all of my tactics and techniques would be right there ready for me to use. Mm. There's no light switch anymore or it's just permanent. There never was. So yeah, right. There probably never was. I didn't realize it, but it just, it doesn't stop. And so you really just have to ask yourself, um, you know, whether or not you want to take it to the level that you're used to because of your profession and in your personal life, you just can't do that. So I have had to do a lot of self-reflection and a lot of self-awareness and a lot of education, mindfulness to, to be included, to really mm -hmm. calm myself down and take that objective look at where I am in my relationships so that I don't cross the boundary and screw them up. <laughs> There's also the flip side where sometimes don't you look at something and you know they're full of it, but they do it so well. And oh, you're going to like, that's well, pretty good. There's so, some finesse there. Yeah. Wait, that's the reason I stayed married for so long. Because yeah. he was such a liar. Like, no, he was a, a borderline narcissist, a <laughs> diagnosed. Yeah. And I took me longer to get divorced because I was so fascinated to have a lab study in my own house. And like, <laughs> really, do you expect me to believe you? I was fascinated and my therapist says, honey, you need to get divorced. Like, I'm having fun. <laughs> he was delusional. And I yeah, I make him believe then I then I believe it. But I was fascinated have he can believe their own lies. Oh yeah. And oh gosh, I have a close family member right now going through a divorce. And the person, I will not mention any names, the person that this family member is divorcing is a narcissistic, pathological liar. Um to such a degree that it's been harming other people in this mm. circle. And that particular person was always scared of me from the first day that they met me because they sure. knew what I did. 
And so when I gave my assessment to my family, it was stay far away, stay far away because this mm -hmm. person is out to hurt everyone but themselves. And so now we're getting to an area where everybody is getting safe again, but you definitely see it. I mean, I use it for good. I always tell people that I use my training for good. And if I see something that causes me concern, I'm going to bring it up and call it out. Okay. So I, um, hog too much of the time. I need to get some questions in here. I've been reading we, the questions. <laughs> I, I know. Um, Sarah Weaver asks, hello all. So glad to be thought of this part of this thought provoking stream. I was wondering if you all had opinions on the difference between a compulsive liar, a habitual liar and a pathological liar. Also a powerful liar in there. <laughs> Yeah, right. So I will. Sorry, Susan, I'm going to jump in real quick with this because I learned something from a new colleague and friend of mine. I absolutely adore her, Ellie Johnson. She's over in Australia. She does what we do. I think, Susan, I introduced you guys together. She told me, she goes, you know what, Lena, when people lie, they make the decision to lie. And I'm like, you're absolutely right. But here's the other thing. In our brains, we have two types of memory. We have to create a lie out of one of them, semantic memory. Every brain in everybody's brains, we consciously make the decision to lie because you cannot suppress the truth. The truth is there. So people come to me and say, well, what happens when I'm talking to this person who believes their lies? No, they can't because the ultimate thing is they know the truth, whether how deep down it's buried and they maybe have rehearsed their lie and it sounds really good. And they're starting to be like, oh yeah, I got this down. This is great. But the thing is, we always have to suppress the truth because we consciously make the decision to lie. So I tell people, don't get worried about if you're having a conversation with what appears to be a pathological liar or a sociopath or whoever, because at some point you can still identify indicators of deception and truth and get to the truth. Susan, what do you think about that? I completely agree. Uh, sooner or later, uh, the strain of your mask are going to fall. Uh, if you're in a situation where you need to assess, uh, interview, and determine in an hour, it can be more difficult to determine it's a pathological liar. But if somebody near in your life or somebody that you can assess more than once to determine baselines, uh, sometimes one of the things that I notice with people who's pathological liars or even believe their lie, the mm -hmm. duping lie. Mm. There, oh, no, yeah. they believe the lie <laughs> during all the process yeah. on the story. May they not leak anything, but they look at you and says, mm -hmm, "Okay," and that's when they dupe in the lie. Count. At some time, I do it on purpose. Like, wow, really? That is amazing. And that's what they dupe in the lie. Count because they're <laughs> looking. The concept that the liars do not look at you more is not true. They look at you more because they want to make sure that you eat in the lie. So okay. when you ego up and it's like, wow, that's fascinating. You walk on the moon. Yes. <laughs> Done. I know it's a lie for that reason. So sooner or later, everything fall on the right place. And uh, there are studies saying that it takes to your brain 30% more time to make a lie even though it's 1.2 to 1.8 seconds for our brain that works so fast, it's a lot of time. So when people are like, mm, use the spacers or like, um, uh, do you want me to, you make time. So mm -hmm. sooner or later, the food is gonna get in your mouth. The point is how much white of time you have to assess. When you have an interrogation that you have a suspect like Lena have, has gone through, you can bring the person from different days and different times and assess how it is. When you do it in a lawsuit, like a, do a trial consultant and things like that, it takes longer and you need to jump in your feet faster. And like, okay, what assessment I'm doing? How, how, what I take to determine if this person is lying or not to tell the lawyer where they need to be pushing. So I think it's a lot of to do with the baseline and the time you have to determine that nobody's 100% perfect and whoever who tell you that is lying to you. Perfect. Yeah. Next question. This is actually for me, <gasps> but I'm going to take advantage of it and answer it, but get your feedback on it and that'll make it more interesting. And that's Eric, what led you to make that guess about Lena's passion? And I'd say it's instinct and just being around and talking to people. Lena falls back on statement analysis, just kind of uh, when we uh, when you did McAfee, right away you went right into that, oh, I know it right away. Um, Susan, I could just 
you're you've studied so hard at the face reading and something about your personality makes me feel like you would rather know who the person is before you even have to engage with them and that's just the feeling that i i get off of you um and every person has their favorite thing chase Hughes loves digital flexion like how tightly are they pressing on their skin he also likes to count things like eye beats or, or foot taps or, or things of that sort chase is very much into that heart rate um pupil dilation he, he actually counts all of that greg hartley is the eye axis in q guy and he's always going to go right to the eyes which way did they go where did they land right out the gate so did you you guys have studied with all kinds of different people have you found that same thing that everybody kind of has their their starting point and then you know they may know other things but you know that that's sort of their their home yeah i think that one of the things that i learned three years ago and i didn't know was the first time somebody did an interview to me was like oh do you know that most people do one channel or two channels and you're doing the seven channels I'm like wait a minute it's the only way to learn and that's when i start meeting other profilers and start making more sense you cannot mm -hmm. do one without the other you always have right. your heart in some place like what's the what is the best uh, the room that you like the most the side of the bed in your profession is the mm -hmm. same but i do from all the people that you name it and all the people in this panel we do more than one channel why oh, sure. because as you cannot be unilateral you need to put everything together because even though maybe you're not the best expert in one of the channels you learn it's complementary or fill the gap on what the initial you do phase reading doesn't work for detection detection deception phase reading is helping me to know how i need to approach to you so if i don't have linguistic body language and micro expression what i do for face reading nothing so mm -hmm. that's the reason you have always a, uh, something that you love the most, but the other things need to come up in order to be good on your profession. Of course. Yeah, I would agree. So I have just recently, in the past six years, I've already uh, dived into leadership realm. So I've gotten certified in organizational change management and some change assessment tools. And I'm two courses away from my certificate in the psychology of leadership at Cornell because I know I can't wait. Um, all of that helps in interpersonal communication skills and self-development. If I am not constantly working to develop myself, and that is how I come across to people, that is um, overcoming my biases, then I am not gonna be the best I'm gonna be at an interviewer, detecting deception, a statement analysis person, whatever I'm doing. So I think all of those soft skills kind of focus in this big cloud that engulfs all parts of what we do. And we use all of that. So there's one thing, and, and Susan mentioned it earlier, that I have um, immersed myself in years ago, and that was personality preferences. And I am a fan of the MBTI tool. I just like it. There's a hundred assessments out there. They're all good. But when you can start to identify people's personality, and you can do that by face reading, you can do it by listening to the words they choose to use. Then you have a good feeling of what their personality makeup is. And that only helps me be a better communicator with that person and to gain their trust faster. Only one thing, um, like everything in life is not what you have is what you do with that. I'm a mm -hmm. certified myers Brick, and I love like you myers Brick. All my team does it and it's great because we can know the basic preferences. Yeah. And the problem is some people use myers Brick, for example, to hire someone. That is not the reason to have Myers break. Phase sure. reading is not to determine if uh, you gonna be a sugar daddy to me. That is your decision. Body language is so it's not what you do; it's how you apply it. And when people is so strong, like oh, this is you should be on a carousel on California. This is BS. Myers break is not proven. Like okay, let me tell you how you use it before you tell me this is BS and not academically proved. Like a lot of things haven't been proved in academia hmm. or the bank in academia after being proven for years, like medication, loss. We, we're not right. going to go there. It's like how you use it. If I sell you a car and you choose to drink and drive, whose fault is the one who sell you the car on you are crazy and you're losing your marbles that you're drinking and driving. So everything has to do how you use it and how respectful you are with 
uh, the use of those things. So for the ones who use it, I always play with the word on the dark side of what I do, but because it's, I think it's funny, but I will never gonna help somebody that says, oh, you can hire this person for the face, for the Myers break or the body language or the micro expression. It's something that Lena and I, we always talk, like, People is using what we do in the wrong way. We are not teaching in the wrong way. And I'm sorry some sound cocky, but I'm tired to hearing people says that what we do is BS. Well, let me tell you, I think the people who use it in the wrong way is the one who you should be looking to. Yeah, and Eric, you had mentioned something earlier about Greg Hartley and he loves his eye axis and cues. So do I, let me tell you, that is my go-to. I will baseline your eye pattern movement analysis within a minute. And that is one of my, most accurate indicators of deception. But yeah. if you were to look that up online, and Susan can attest this, you will see so many scholarly articles defacing it and saying it's voodoo science and it doesn't work. Well, guess what? When you learn how to use it correctly, it will be your best friend. And it's so accurate. I couldn't do my job today without knowing that knowledge. It's okay, I think a lot of that comes from misuse of it, though. Exactly. Because it is... Exactly. Um, it is um, pop science or or yeah. fake science if you don't actually baseline. Exactly. And Greg would be the first one to say that. There's 10% yeah. that look the opposite way yes. when they're um, thinking or, or whatever. When they're doing it's, a visual cue, Yeah. 90% look one way, but 10% look the other way. And 10% is a large margin. Being exactly. right, wrong one out of 10 times is huge. Yes, that chart may work for a couple people, a few people, fat, whatever. It may work for some people, but it doesn't work for all people. And so you really have to know how to be a good interviewer, ask thought provoking questions in order to get that person to go to their episodic memory and pull down events and chunks of information that they have to think about. And when you do that, you can see where they dig to go find them. Some people look down to dig. Some people look up to the right, up to the left, sideways. You just have to get that baseline. But it's accurate. You know what? Uh, one of the things that I, you're never going to hear me talking about anybody on uh, on the media uh, in the wrong way. I, I admire oh, you. I know. No, I <laughs> don't do that. I don't do that because I think everybody has the I right need to drama. Do I, I can pull no, a quote. I know. Yeah. I'm going to give you a better drama. It's like... <laughs> Do not go for that 10 tips to be more likable, 10 ways to know if your partner is cheating on you. This is a science, mm -hmm. pseudoscience, university science, training science, whatever. You cannot do this in 48 hours. Mm -hmm. This take practice. You need to do it every day. Sometimes you do only things for free to learn new things because you don't have, you need to test your classes. You use your friends to learn everything every day. Like this is not like, oh, I read an article who says that and that. Like who wrote the article? What are, what are the batons? What are the training this person have? How many years of experience? Because the devil know, know more for being the devil than for being old than being the devil. So. If this is a science, this is a profession, this is something, it's a craft that you need to practice. I do not recall one day even being on vacation, then I don't read an article, I question myself and I try to keep learning. Like Lena, I'm in three certifications now and next year I'm gonna start learning how to read lips. I don't need to, but I want to. This is not stop. So for the ones who go into the articles or oh, the, girls magazine like cosmopolitan 10 ways to know if your partner is cheating and you're like oh come on really poor guy he's gonna get divorced when he's not doing anything why because somebody who doesn't understand and google some other articles put it together and print it uh, uh, that's what drives me crazy i would say one of the <laughs> things that drive me crazy the worst on this is people thinking that they can do an online class and they're an expert like come on yeah fair enough now, moving to the next question, because I've got Now to I give help. you enough, come. <laughs> ah. um, Ash K, are there archetypes for psychopathic faces as far as reading and expressions? Mm -hmm. I don't have any psychology background, so I would uh, I would say from the face reading standpoint, you can determine certain level of a stress, but I will, I am not allowed or prepared to do any things who have to do with diagnostic on that level. And so I need to retract for respect to that question. Agreed. Mm -hmm. 
Agree. I do the same thing. I get asked a lot of similar questions and I do not have a degree in psychology and I'm not going to tell you something if I don't know it. Fair enough. So we're jumping ahead. Um, Susan and Lena, much appreciate you for broadening my scope of human behavior from Mark Barron. Thank you, Mark. And Busha Busha, Lena, how did you get into your line of work? How does one get started with a career like yours? And Dan and Jones. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, I, I, it, I didn't plan it out. I joined the Navy on a dare because I didn't have a job after getting my master's degree. And my dad said, um, you need a job and you need to make money. So I had a friend, he just enlisted in the Navy in the intelligence career. And he said, you know what? You should do it because you love adventure and excitement and it's a challenge. I was like, ah, but six years, okay, I'll do it. And literally I fell into every opportunity. It's I'm blessed that the opportunities came to me when they did and I accepted them. So, yeah. Next one. Now this one's odd. Um, busha busha. Lena, Amanda Knox is guilty. Do you think so as well? If so, what makes it so? All right. So I could do a dissertation on Amanda Knox. Okay, but you'll get um, it in a minute. No. Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> Just one minute. Um, I will say this. I am not a mind reader. But what I do know are the indicators of deception, both verbal, nonverbal, and the indicators of truth, verbal, nonverbal. That's what I do know. Um, and what I can tell you from what I know is that she's holding back something. But what I can't do is tell you what that is because I'm not a mind reader. Now, would I love to interview her? Yes, because then I could use my art to get to the truth. But I, there's something missing there. And I have done tons of analysis. I use all of her videos in my training because of mm. body language, of um, incongruent facial micro expressions, her words, everything. It's so much. So I don't know if she's guilty. I don't know if she killed Meredith. I don't know anything. But what I do know is she knows something that she's not saying. Have you read uh, Malcolm Gladwell's latest book? Mm -mm. You might one? want to. Mm -hmm. um, uh, something Strangers, Talking to Strangers. I think it's yeah, called. I have it in audiobook too. Okay, well, I, I pretty much have to do audiobooks. So, Lena, get your other book in audio, please. Yeah. Um, I'll <laughs> oh, by the way, uh, uh, Lena's, no, book, <clears throat> Lena's right. book is on audio and paper. I have both. So, well, both one of them is. She has yeah. another book. Yeah, that's not. Um, anyway, in that book, um, Malcolm Gladwell uses her case as kind of a, wow. a debunker for not understanding people and communicating with them that she is a dislikable or unlikable person by nature. And with that, it sets people the wrong way. And that's why she was misread. And that's my gross analysis, but you may want to check it out. I mean, he's a big author and it'd be interesting. Yeah. You follow all that. And it's interesting because it's like what we were talking about before, the biases, the halo and the horns, right? When mm. I when I interview people, when I assess people, I don't care if I like you or not. That's got to go in the trash can. That All of that has got to go aside. Um, I also am not thinking and judging you about what you did. So I talk to suspects who have killed people, take the judgment out and go for an objective view of whether or not they are telling the truth or if they're telling a little bit or stretch truth. So always keeping that um, with her again, they painted a picture. So everybody watching her wants to hate her. Right. And they came up with the Foxy Nazi and all this stuff. So that, of course, is going to bias what we think about her. And if we don't like her, we're going to tend to see all that deception. But here's mm -hmm. what I do know. When you look at interviews specifically, and I know Susan has seen some of this, you can see the behavioral incongruence. I mean, that's so accurate on whether or not people are telling you the truth or not telling you the truth. And because it happens so frequently with her interviews, I don't think it is a biased thing of, oh, I just don't like her because of this. I mean, it's there for a reason. There is a lot of, there is a lot of manipulation and not liking someone because we talk about that, Eric. When people is fighting you or disagreeing with you, everything go viral. So you always need to have something to distract the media. And by the way, I don't know if I ever can be in front of her. I just want the raw material for the interviews. Mm -hmm. What happened with the interviews, uh, they have a person who looking for like the trailers on the movie. I went to the cinema for trailers like, are you really, can you give me my money back in my popcorn? Mm -hmm. This is horrible. So uh, there is a lot of editing happening on the interviews. I love There's when they're question. raw, live, 
because that one you can see the reality but she was manipulated to be guilty i'm not saying that she's not what i'm saying is what we need as a human being like Lina says not sure. to be biased to via the media if mm -hmm. you don't like the person because you don't like it great go for it but you need to understand is editing a lot is happening and depending what is the new trend that you're looking for that week yeah. there's also other factors too like if somebody is there what's the camera person doing at the time is oh, there yeah. a boom operator there's a lot of things you can't see and they may be evasive or they may be looking because the guy just dropped a bottle over there you know at that time so mm -hmm. all of that is definitely true so devin harris asks in a note slash letter are you only are you looking only at words and phrases or are you also evaluating how they form their letters yes <laughs> so um there's an exercise i do in all my training and i actually make people hand write out statements because i'm looking for doing a little handwriting analysis on it i'm looking for your baseline number one because the way people write can also clue you into their personality type and whether or not they're experiencing positive and negative emotions so sometimes people when they're experiencing positive emotions could be because they're telling the truth and sometimes when they're experiencing negative, like a drop in a baseline, it could be because they're lying. Not all the time though, nothing is 100% in this world, but it does give me a good insight as to whether or not you're feeling positive, negative, and your personality. So to answer the question, yes. Susan, how about you? Uh, I'm gonna give an example of when I was studying with Lena a couple of years ago. Uh, she gave us, as a, I think the second day we did a class, we need to write on a statement that is true and what is false by handwriting and i knew i already get training i knew what she was looking for and i read the story like 15 times like she's not gonna cut me next day like susan your story number two is like like how you know like these three words and a one page so i knew about it I'm, I'm, I'm i don't know if i'm an expert but i'm well rehearse and a statement mm -hmm. analysis and i knew she was looking for a lie and i knew i cannot lie and one of the story need to be realized is i'm gonna call lena on this not because being cocky is like i need to test her to test me and she caught me so what i'm saying is it doesn't matter how much you think you can hide it's always something that is going to give you away and again you need to start paying attention to the details and the context if you only see the tree you're never going to see what is behind the forest and if you always see the forest you never see the colors of the trees what i'm saying is you don't have one way for uh, every experience. It's like you don't have the same when you need to pay toll and when you need to go where the trucks are driving to the city. So you need to adapt from any experience, but you always ended up leaking one way or another. And I know I'm going to get sick when I see my own recording, like I was doing pacifier. What is wrong with me? What I was thinking about. But yeah. You can't think about it. You just got to be normal. Uh, Mark, <laughs> I'm Mark sorry. What was normal? <laughs> what is it? Okay. Can no. you can you define what is normal, Lina, please? Because I, I lost that track a couple of years ago. <laughs> it doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. One last note on that. Mark McLish, I don't know if you're familiar with him, a statement analysis. Yeah. Guy. yeah. He That's stated hard. that he likes to um, make sure that they're given an ink pen when they write because you learn a lot with the sentences they stop and cross out on. Yes, yes. So he is the godfather of statement analysis. He is the one who created that term. So we are all... Uh, indebted to him for our knowledge okay fantastic i yeah. studied with amino and sapir from the uh, israeli government he came to the united states in 1987 to train hostage negotiation police and train and he was a maclish teacher actually nice nice all right i'm looking through the questions because we are already running over uh, and like always um, uh, uh, Eric, do you think you're going to have any chance to two women on the show like you're done? No, no, no. This is great. <laughs> and honestly, it, it gives me a reason. So then when I invite you back, I'll say you didn't finish the job. There you go. Can, right. can we do a happy hour next time? Oh, uh, yeah. Sure. Uh, nobody said you couldn't drink. Okay. <laughs> oh, you, you shouldn't have told me early. It's happy hour someplace in the world. Do you yes. think this is water? Uh, no. I don't know. But do an analysis. Actually, uh, I have <laughs> clients who need to move to keynote speaking online, and they says I cannot do it. Like put vodka on your glass of water. Nobody gonna know. I'm like, really? Like do it? Is that helping you? Just measure it. Be careful. 
A little bit. A little well, I'm bit. gonna go with one more question here, and then I'm gonna talk something out. This is from Bence, who had his face red but didn't show up to have it mm. red. So Bence is a bad boy. Um, Lena, would you share? with us how you ask questions and i want both of you to do it obviously what are you looking for in interrogation is there a right way of questioning for mm -hmm. example you test them first for visual and or auditorial memories so i guess that's um eye accessing cues that you're going to look for when you're baselining you see the happy face lena have go for it like you're like in a cage i know yeah. i'm like um yeah where do i start with that so yes there is a method to asking questions there's good questions and really bad questions you should avoid the questions that you should always use if you want to get answers is an interrogative simple concise specific question so when i ask susan susan what is the name of the town you're from and susan answers me well uh, I'll, I'll doing. there you go it, i ask tell people what is it you want to know just ask for it but don't use a lot of fluff because then people are going to get confused. And if the question is bad, you're not going to get the answer you want. And if you don't get the answer you want, you're going to get frustrated and take it out on the person when it wasn't their fault, it was yours. So tighten up your questions. Always start off with a who, what, uh, where, when, why, and how. A yes and no question only gets you yes and no. You can't work with that, right? Unless you're really using it to check for a lie. So I have what I call my four go-to lie exposing questions that I share in my training. I can't go through them right now. Um, but <laughs> everybody but, uh, go to Lisa's like, okay. And literally <laughs> truthful people answer one way and liars answer another way. Most of the time I'm going to say, cause again, nothing's 100%, but they're darn good. And I use them in every single interview and they're yes and no questions. But if you really want to get information, it's gotta be an interrogative question. So um, to get a baseline, what I want to do is I need you to do most of the talking, not me. So I have to ask you thought provoking interrogative questions. So you give me a narrative response. So in baselining, you're talking about rapport building stuff and what their favorite hobby is, something that they're relaxed about and they don't mind talking about. But the only way you're going to get there is with an open ended question. Right. And so they're really critical. You always want to avoid the, well, didn't you? Well, wouldn't you say? And wouldn't you agree? Those are just bad. They're negative. They're leading um, compound questions or two questions in one. Well, who said that? And when did you hear it? Okay, which one do you want? Right? It's just going to cause too much waste of time and confusion and frustration. So questioning is really critical. Now, what you don't want to do, though, is you don't want to come across as an interrogator like I do sometimes and just fire off these interrogative questions because that's not really how a normal conversation goes. But if you want information, you have to ask an interrogative question. And it can't be leading. It can't be a forced choice. It can't be a closed ended or a compound or negative. So it's really focusing on the word you use for the question. And questions that I'm asking here would be terrible for an interrogation because I'm trying to have a conversation. Yeah. I, no, I'm just saying, I'm pointing out there's a good time to say, would you say or have you thought things like that versus you're trying to get things very specifically tightened up. Susan. Uh, I play dumb because I never was Columbo. an interrogator. Yeah. Like, um, Tell me again, who, who was the one who changed the tire? Oh, I'm late because uh, I have a punch tire. 15 minutes later, like, who was the one who you called to fix the tire? And says, oh, you're, you have AAA. Like, no, I did, I told you it was the, another thing. Like, so I play dumb and go back to the questions a couple of times because I haven't been in an interrogator setting as a, an interrogator. I train people who does it. I use, I learned that use compound questions to know what you want to go away with. So mm -hmm. five, four, three, two, one. So what you did yesterday with whom? When you went for dinner, what you have? So I I see what they choose. I'm like, mm, you what are you avoiding? What you want to? You trying to get me away from this? So I'm gonna go back. So that I have the Colombo mindset. So I go back like, ah, you had chicken. Who else was there? My coworkers, ah, uh, I hear your new assistant is awesome. She was there. How is how she doing with the rest of the guys? Oh, we have a blast. I knew your assistant was there and you don't want to say it. So I keep going, digging, playing dumb. Mine, <laughs> that's my style. So most people think, think they're like, she's deaf, like she's something wrong in the head. Like I play that game because it's better 
like Lina says, you get more with a spoon of honey than a punch in, in the chest. And it's true. So being a woman is easy to play dumb to when you want to know something from buying a car to get a new computer or oh, I need to go to the supermarket and get an extended warranty. I start making questions and playing it stupid and it's, I always get away with it. <laughs> Perfect. And on that note, I'd like to have you guys back, of course. Now, Susan is going to be back sooner. Mm. And I want to put it out to everyone. Um, she will be doing another face reading, this time with masks, because Susan wants to throw down the challenge. So in the upcoming weeks, I hope everybody is subscribed. I will be posting for it and seeking people to submit photos of themselves in masks one from the front, one from profile, so she gets the ears. Obviously, with the mask, ears become important, and they'll tie your hair back. So Lena's cheating, as an example. I know. But, um, but I read Lena already. So. <laughs> of course she did. I got my reading. And yeah. private, obviously. And I did, too, in public. Uh, you guys can watch that episode. <laughs> I gave you some hints about the naughty things, but, but that was in private, so... <laughs> Well, hey, I got a baseline by the behavior panel, so you guys can all check that out. Too. Oh, that's awesome. I have to check that out. So it, no, it's quite uncomfortable. What do, you think <laughs> have the, what do you think I have the red T-shirt? Because you have to tell one when, like, are you a Star Trek? Like, I know what I'm going to be wearing next one. Yeah. All right. Well, if everybody enjoys this, please subscribe. Please follow. I will keep having these great folks and I'll probably change it up here and there. Like I'd love to have Lena and Greg or Susan and Scott. And um, it's just a lot of fun. It's an endless topic. And I, I really like mixing it up with all the different folks. And for now, people can find Lena at the congruencygroup.com and Susan at humanbehaviorlab.com. Correct? Correct, sir. Ladies, thank you so much. Thank you. Live long and